Hello, my name is Keith Lampkin from Met Aaron, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. I was asked to talk to you a little bit about climate change and what things may look like in the future. So let's jump straight in. There's three areas I really wanted to cover over the next half hour or so. Uh, how do we know our climate is changing? What can we expect into the future? And then really by knowing all this information, how does it actually help us out now? So let's get started. Now to start, we'll look at a bit of planetary physics, but I guarantee it's nothing you don't already know. So our energy comes from the sun and some of that energy comes straight towards the center of the earth at the equator. And because the earth is a, is a sphere, that energy impacts directly at the equator and most of that energy then gets absorbed by the earth. And I like to think of it a little bit like kicking a football. If you were to kick a football in the middle of the football, the ball will go forward, the energy would go into the ball. But if you were to kick at the same strength and just skim the top of the football, well, the football will still go forward, but not nearly as much. And that's a little bit like the way the, the Earth as a sphere absorbs energy coming from the sun. And as a consequence, the equator is that bit warmer than the poles, and we get this temperature difference or differential, and that's what drives our weather. But let's leave the textbooks for a minute, and let's have a look at real life. I quite like this animation. This is from our friends at UMET SAS. These are the European satellite people. And these are real images of the Earth stitched together all around the globe. And what we see is we see the weather patterns. We see the, the air at the equator being heated and that being lifted up. And we get a lot of clouds forming there from the upward air. And those clouds drop a lot of moisture. And that's where we get the rainforests. So the rainforests are all along the equator there. And that drier air then, now with no moisture in it, falls then either side of the equator, and that's where we get our deserts. Have a look what Ireland is in the middle there. And look how many weather patterns Ireland gets relative to the rest of uh, the world. We have that motion moving around the earth, passes up over the Rockies, comes down and spirals into those low pressure systems that we're so familiar with coming in across the Atlantic. Also look how green Ireland is compared to other areas in Canada and Russia at the same latitude. And again, that's from that Gulf Stream, keeping that steady flow of warm water up towards. I picked this particular month because this was Hurricane Ophelia back in 2017. And that was a full-blown hurricane. And we felt the effects of that quite strongly in Ireland. Fortunately, we had three deaths there. Okay, so I like to look at that example first because it's good at illustrating the difference between weather and climate. So when we talk about weather, we're talking about the current conditions of the atmosphere. Or what I like to say is weather is what we see when we look out the window. Is it rain? Is it windy? It's the current conditions. But when we talk about climate, what we mean by climate, climate is the average weather over a long period of time. And in climatological circles, we typically take a period of about 30 years. So climate is the typical weather we would expect to get at a certain region at a certain time of year. So it's important we notice the difference between those two terms. Now we observe weather and climate using the same instrumentations. And these days are quite sophisticated. So as well as having a standard weather station, which we measure the pressure and temperature, rainfall, and so forth, we also have a whole suite of modern instrumentation all around the planet. Everything from geostationary satellites to polar orbiting satellites, to instruments on aircrafts, which measure the profiles going up and down through the atmosphere. We have weather radars, and we have a whole host of sophisticated ocean monitoring equipment as well. One of my favorites is the, the weather balloon, still one of the best ways to measure the vertical profile up through the atmosphere. And this is important because weather and climate models, they're three-dimensional models. So as well as just getting information along the surface of the earth, we also need information up through the atmosphere as well. And a lot of people don't know, but all around the world, weather balloons are launched tw twice a day at exactly the same time. And that way, it gives you that kind of three-dimensional snapshot of the planet 
and that information gets fed into weather forecast models. And then when you build that information up over time, you can see how that changes over longer term climate periods. Now, something that's important that we look at is this graph. What we're looking at here is the energy balance for the Earth. And because of all this instrumentation we have all around the planet, we can actually put numbers to the physics. So as we said earlier, the energy comes from the sun. So that's that yellow bar on the left-hand side there. And we're able to measure how many units of energy come from the sun. Now, as that sun's energy comes in, some of it gets reflected by the clouds, some of it gets absorbed by the atmosphere, and quite a lot of that actually reaches the surface of the Earth. And as we all know from school, the Earth then re-radiates that energy back out uh, as a form of heat energy back out into the atmosphere. And some of that energy escapes from the planet, and some of that energy gets trapped by the atmosphere. Now, if we do the sums, and we have a look at the amount of energy units coming in and the amount of energy units coming out, what Mother Nature has done over a very long time is she's balanced that. So she's balanced the Earth's energy budget. But at the moment, we're seeing that about 340 units, it's what per meter squared, but the units don't matter, 340 amounts of energy packets are coming into the planet. And if we look at the amount of energy that's leaving the planet, then we have 100 plus 239. So 340 is coming in. It's only about 239 going out. So we've slightly more energy coming in than going out. And that extra energy is accumulating all the time. And that's what's slowly heating the planet. Now, what's changed during this time is the greenhouse gases. And as we know, we've been pumping more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in particular, but others as well, are fairly good at trapping that heat, acting like a blanket around the surface, keeping in that extra small energy packet. Now, it is only a small amount, but those small amounts over the years are accumulating and accumulating. And this is leading to global warming. Now, it's important to realize global warming is the cause. That's, that's what's happening. The extra greenhouse gases is keeping the planet uh, increasing its, en its, its energy and hence warming the planet. But because the planet is warming, it has the knock-on effects. And this is the knock-on effects, uh, almost like steroids on weather systems. It gives energy systems that extra potential to be more severe than they otherwise necessarily would be. And this is where we can kind of see the warming planet leads to higher sea levels, the melting of the ice, but also more energetic systems as well. For example, a warmer atmosphere can carry more moisture. The more moisture we have in the, in the atmosphere, the heavier rainfall events can potentially happen. Now, let's take, for example, we were to look at temperature data from a weather station. So take any weather station, let's say it's in Ireland, and this is the temperature data from 1900 till now. When we say the normal climate of Ireland, what we mean by normal is the average weather we get over the last three full decades. So it's the, the average weather we get between 1981 to 2010. So if I met Aaron forecasters on TV and they say it's warmer than normal, by normal they mean the average weather during that period. It's the typical climate we'd expect in Ireland. Now, let's say we took another period in the past. What was considered normal weather at the beginning of the century is different to what we consider normal weather now. And it's that change or difference between normal climates that we call climate change. Now, what if we could predict into the future and we could see the type of weather or temperature we'd expect of that weather station into the future? There's nothing stopping us taking a 30 year period in the future as well. And that's what would be the normal temperature into the future. And we can see how the normal temperature in the future is different from the normal temperature now and then plan accordingly. And that's what climatologists do, and that's what the climate science is doing all around the world. So climate change is the difference between these typical normal climates 
And because the climate is changing, that means the average typical weather we would expect is also changing. Now let's take a look at some observations. This is Valencia Observatory, uh, Med Aaron's largest weather station down in Carasafina County Kerry about 100 years ago. And here it is today. And we'll take a stereotypical observer of weather, and let's call him John. Now, let's say John worked his entire professional life down in Carasafina. And during that time, he was able to stitch together climate records like this. Here we're looking at rainfall records from 1880 to near present. The top line there is from Valencia and Carasafina, and the bottom line is Phoenix Park. And think of where you are in your careers now. 40 years is a long time. Imagine you spent your entire career making weather observations. That's what 40 years looks like on the climate record for, for Valencia. Now, John worked as part of a team of six, so his actual contribution was closer to that. And when you see one person's entire career contributing to that amount of a climate record set, you begin to get a feel for the monumental effort it takes in order to produce reliable, consistent climate record sets that can be used for monitoring climate change. Now, thanks to John and people like John all around the world, we're able to keep an eye on how the temperature of the planet is changing. And what we're seeing, even though it varies year on year, is, is there are very consistent trends of an increased warming over the last 100 plus years. And there's many ways to represent this. There's climate spirals and climate stripes. They're all effectively saying the same thing, that the planet on average is warming with time. I particularly like this animation from our colleague Antti from uh, Finland. And what the animation shows, it shows a blue circle is the temperature in countries of the world below normal and an orange-red circles show the temperature above normal. Ireland's temperature is in the green box over on the right-hand side there. What we're seeing all around the world is that there is a consistent increase in warming. Ireland incidentally uh, registers about a one degree warming over the period. Now, let's have a look at some Irish data. So each orange dot here represents the average temperature all over Ireland over the last 100 plus years. And while the signal is quite variable, the white line there is the best fit trend to it. So the white line there is essentially what we'd call the, the climate or the climate trend. And we're seeing it's going upward, which shows that it's actually got an increase in trend. So the signal that we're seeing globally, we're also seeing in Irish data as well, that Ireland is increasing. And the temperature is increased by over that period, again, is about one degree. So it agrees with what we saw in, in Nancy's animation. Now, question for you. Get a pen there and jot down. What do you think the average temperature in Ireland is during the summer? Any guesses? Now, next to that, write down what you think the average temperature in Ireland is during the winter. And take one one from the other. What's the difference between those two? I bet you get a number bigger than one. So the average temperature in Ireland during the summer depends where you are, but give or take average over the country and over day and night is about 14 degrees. And the average temperature in the winter is about five. So 40 minus five is nine degrees. So answer me this, if every year Ireland goes through a nine degree average temperature change without any much difficulty at all, is the difference of a one degree temperature change really that big of a deal? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. And let me show you why. Climate follows what we call a normal distribution. So most of the time, the weather patterns we get in around what we'd expect for climate. Sometimes we get them colder than we would expect. Sometimes we get them warmer than we'd expect. Now, 
if you move the average climate but even a small amount what you're doing is you're biasing the extremes so you're getting way more of one particular extreme than you would normally get and your ecosystems and your civilizations and your infrastructures are all built around the normal weather you'd expect to get and if you shift those shift those extremes then all of a sudden your ecosystems your timings as well as your infrastructures may not be appropriate for the level of extremes you're more expecting to get and this is where the difficulty is and this isn't just in theory we're actually seeing this in real data so here we're looking at temperatures in february over the last 60 years or so and what the green dots are representing they're showing the temperatures we get in february or all across ireland uh, from the middle of the century 30 years in the, in the middle of the uh, uh, century from 1960 to 1989 and the navy dots they're showing the, the last 30 years and if we were to fit a normal curve to it it looks something like that and more recent 30 years we see something like that so we're actually seeing this shift in the normal periods and we see the temperatures here in February in Ireland, what we're actually seeing here is that spring is arriving earlier on average. Now, okay, so we've clear evidence that our temperature uh, and our climate is changing, not just globally, but also here in Ireland. So what can we expect from the future? Okay, enter climate models. Now, climate models, they started off quite basic in the 70s and have traveled over a journey, largely matching themselves with sophistication as computer processing power has uh, increased. As extra computer power has become available, we can add an awful lot more physics to the models. So we can start adding extra physics, we can start building in the oceans, we can start building in the interactions between the land, the atmosphere, the oceans, the cryospheres building chemistry and so forth. So the models are constantly, constantly getting more and more um, useful and more accurate as time goes on. Now, the way it works within the global community is that research group, typically involving many hundreds of people, will develop a climate model and run it. But in order to be able to compare different climate models from different climate groups, there has been standard scenarios set were called RCPs or representative concentration pathways. And what they're showing is they're showing that different kind of uh, energy forcing. So when we go back to our energy budget, what happens is that they're related to different amounts of energy packets that are being kept by the Earth, so different warming levels. And by having these standard scenarios, we can model through different future scenarios and then compare results with other um, models and other modeling groups and that's exactly what the, the ipcc do the intergovernmental panel on climate change what they actually do is they actually collate all the different results from all the different modeling groups and put it together to try and get a consensus of what future um, weather systems and uh, climate is likely to be incidentally the latest models that will be coming out next year they use a, a slightly different uh, scenarios called shared socioeconomic pathways, which build in a lot of more social factors and not just the pure physics and science factors into it as well. And here what we're seeing, we're seeing a simulation from a, a MedAir and an EPA and a, a Marine Institute co-founded project run by our friends in, in ICHEC, where we're modeling using a, a European model, EC Earth, how the planet will evolve from a temperature point of view over these four different future scenarios and the way it works is you run your global model over past observations taken from the people like john and his colleagues to make sure everything matches up and then you let it run into the future over these pre prescribed uh, scenarios to see how likely that parameter uh, is likely to change into the future uh, almost creating a kind of an envelope of possibilities for decision makers so very often when you're quoting a future projection you'd quote a particular scenario is it a high-end scenario an 8.5 scenario a middle or, or a low-end scenario and all the scenarios the warming increases and collating this information similar information all around the world we get a good picture of what the atmosphere uh, and the planet is going to change so we're seeing increased warming 
we're seeing changes in rainfall patterns, we're seeing increased sea level uh, levels and so forth as well. And that's great from a global perspective, but it's not all that useful for local decision making, particularly in, a, in, a, in an, Ireland, an island uh, the size of Ireland. So we do a, a trick called downscaling, and downscaling is something we use in the weather forecast world a lot as well, where you take a global model and then you rerun it on a much smaller grid where you can kind of add in extra physics and get extra resolution to that model. And the net effect means you can change something from a global model that looks like that, that's Ireland and the UK, into something closer to that resolution. And you can add extra decision making in on top of that. And something we're over and asked, are they any good? Well, the graph on the left there, that's rainfall over Ireland from actual observations from the likes of John and his colleagues. And the graph on the right, that's the climate model, uh, downscale climate model. And they compare quite well. That's at 18 kilometers downscaled, six kilometers downscaled, and another two kilometers downscaled. And look how similar the model on the right compares to the actual observations on the right, on the left. Okay, so when we use that model and let it run into the future, and I'll just run through some of these, we get a feel for uh, some of these parameters and how they're likely to change into the future. So let's say temperature, for example, we can see how temperature is likely to change in Ireland. But we're also kind of picking up patterns as well. We look at heat waves here, we can kind of see some contours. We can kind of see through a number of the different scenarios that we're likely to get more heat waves through the south and east of the country as opposed to the northwest of the country. And again, this makes sense to what we're already seeing around Europe, the Mediterranean and how some of those heat waves are pushing up from the Mediterranean, from the south towards the, the north. And again, this all adds to useful decision-making systems, water resource management and so forth. We're expecting the growing season to increase because of the extra temperature, big factor in uh, growth. Rainfall is an interesting one. So give or take, we're expecting the amount of rain to fall in any particular year to be in and around the same, maybe a slightly more. But a pattern of that rainfall, we expect to change quite significantly. We're expecting to see a lot more heavy rainfall events in the winter and a lot more periods of drier weather during the summer. And wind, we actually expect to see a small decrease in wind. I know the energy industry are very interested in paying attention to this one. Okay, so that's a fairly quick look at some of the things we're expecting into the future. Okay, so there's a lot of knowledge in that. So I guess to finish up then, by knowing all this information, how does it actually help us out? And this brings us to a, uh, a relatively new area of climate science called climate services. And this is, now that we have all this huge volume of information, how can we actually use that to make informed decisions? So let's take some of the sectors. Let's take the, the farmer. He's interested to know, well, what kind of plants should he be planting in, into the future? Or particularly in forestry, what kind of forests or trees should we plant now so that they're still performing well in mid-century? Obviously, the energy industry from either wind or solar are fairly interested to know how those parameters are likely to change. And the water management people are very interested to know about um, if they build a new housing estate now, for example, will there be enough capacity in the nearby rivers in order to feed water into those uh, new houses? So these are all important decisions that need to be made now, but are related to future climate. And the idea behind climate services is you take all this meteorological information we were just discussing, the socioeconomic variables and the expert knowledge from the individual sectors themselves, and blend them together then to actually get a kind of a, an output or a useful product that the decision maker can make informed decisions on. And this is really kind of a, a big upcoming area in, in climate science now. But even within those sectors themselves, there are different types of decision makers. So I quite like this analogy here, but we have people which are referred to as sailors. And the sailor may, might be interested in the science behind any of this. They just want to know the direction of change. Will things continue to warm? And if so, for how long? There's also people referred to as divers, and these are pretty much the, the academics and maybe the engineers. They need to get their hands on, the, on the, 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 the deeper science, all that data, they need that to do their own number crunching. And then there's what we call the observers, and the observers are like governments, government departments. They're looking at all the other sectors and seeing what's kind of happening, and they're trying to put policies and plans in place so that all these uh, different uh, sectors can properly integrate and work together.
And all these decision makers all need the same information translated into different ways so they can make the best informed decisions. Okay, and this is all very important because there are significant changes happening. And like we say, with that shifting of the, uh, the climate norms, we're expecting to get more extreme events. And these quite literally will lead to economic damage, property damage, and as we've already seen, and uh, is likely to see again in the future, literally the loss of life. So these are fairly, fairly important decisions to try and get right now to protect ourselves into the future. Now, it's not all bad news, and I want to leave you with a story, and it's a story of hope. It's actually a story of ozone. Do you remember the ozone layer? The hole in the ozone. We don't really hear that much about it anymore, do we? Back in the 1970s, scientists, through measurements, discovered uh, depletion of the ozone layer, became known as the ozone hole. They discovered what the problem was. It was the release of these CFCs, these chlorofluorocarbons, into the atmosphere, which were destroying the ozone. They convinced policymakers of the dangers and the course of action that needed to be taken. And this ultimately led to legally binding agreements, the Montreal Protocol. And as a result, countries reduced and eventually banned the use of these CFCs. So what we're seeing through Medera measurements and other measurements around the world is that the ozone layer is actually leveled out and it's beginning to recover. So through this template, a global catastrophe, environmental catastrophe, has been prevented. Now think of the parallels in global warming. Scientists, through measurements, discovered that the planet was warming. They discovered the problem behind that was adding additional greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. They convinced politicians to put plans in place, Paris Agreement, legally binding plans to fix the problem. And then the action hasn't quite happened yet, and that's where we are now. We're at that action stage. Okay, but by taking action, we have the ability to reverse the effects and limit the effects of global warming. And the local authorities are key in this and their equivalents all around the world because they act as the enablers between the actual policy and the people on the grounds to actually implementing this action. Now, I'm quite confident because we've already seen through the ozone story that the template works. So fingers crossed in our warming world, we can do it again. Thanks for listening.